everybody, everybody's on Matthew. It's not streaming to your Twitter, but we'll we'll fix that next time. But it's streaming everywhere else. And uh, for those of you who weren't behind the scenes, Brian Kaplan and I are uh, planning to get lunch soon because we both live in the DC area. We'll make sure that we are 20 feet apart at the lunch table, just so that we're socially distant and then we're, we'll eat with our masks on and uh, it'll be, it'll be great. <laughs> uh, but yes, for everyone uh, joining on right now, just to give you a quick uh, update, this is uh, Dr. Brian Kaplan is a professor of economics at the, at George Mason university. And he actually has a, this is the second time he's on the educational freedom Institute podcast. So it's really great. He was so great the first time we obviously had to bring him back on and we're going to talk about his best-selling book, The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money. Sorry, uh, Matthew, for uh, covering you up for a second. I'm used uh, to it now. I always get the middle <laughs> slot. I know I'm going to be covered up. I'm good. As, every, as everybody knows, Matthew Nielsen is the uh, co-founder and uh, ex uh, uh, president of the board at the Educational Freedom Institute, and I am uh, Corey DeAngelis, director of school choice at the Educational at the uh, Freedom you got too many freaking affiliations. I am the director of school <laughs> choice at the Reason Foundation and the executive director at the Educational Freedom Institute. Uh, but yes, uh, so Brian, thanks so much again for, for being with us for a second time. Fantastic to be here, Corey. Yeah, so just really quickly, uh, I know a lot of our listeners are familiar with your book and they probably heard us talking about it last time, but could you give us kind of the skinny, uh, you know, high level uh, conclusions that you found in your book and maybe even just you know, what motivated you to write the book and just some background on that? Yeah, definitely. Uh, so the case against education begins with a puzzle. Education definitely seems to cause your income to, uh, to go up, seems to help your career. And yet most of what you learn in school seems very irrelevant to any actual practical job that you would do. Unless, of course, you're going to be a professor like me. And then you just repeat the stuff that you were taught. All right. So why would that be? And the explanation that I put forward is that a great deal of the payoff from education is not because you're learning useful skills in school, though that happens too, but rather because you are getting a certification, a stamp on your forehead, or as economists call it, a signal. So by doing well in school, you are persuading employers that you are worthwhile. Uh, the uh, slogan that I like sometimes is to say, we usually think of education as being job training, but that's not true. Really, education is a passport to the real training, which happens on the job. All right. Now, from the point of view of an individual, it doesn't really matter why education helps your career. All that matters is that it does. But from the point of view of society, it matters a very great deal for the following reason. If one person wants to go and get a better job, then whether you are going to school to get skills or going to get the stamp on your forehead, either way, you go there and it works. But if you are, if you are selecting education policy for society, the model matters. If kids are actually learning a lot of useful skills in school, they go there and then they enrich not only themselves, but society. If what you're doing is mainly signaling, then you go to school, you get a bunch of extra signals on your foreheads. And then what do employers do? They jack up the expectations of how much you need, you know, how much, uh, what credentials do you actually need to be considered worthy to not have your application thrown in the garbage. And therefore with signaling, expansion of education primarily leads not to an upskilling of the workforce, but rather to what researchers call credential inflation, credential inflation. And this is where you have the same credentials that you know, the, you know, the same credentials that your grandparents or uh, parents could have, could have used to get a really good job. And for you, it's a mediocre job or flipping it around jobs that previously your parents or grandparents didn't need any fancy degrees to get, like being a secretary. Now you need those very degrees. Right? Uh, so, and then the, the real punchline of all this is that the, there's an enormously unpopular education policy that actually has great merit intrinsically, and that is austerity, cutting education spending. Right? And what's striking to me is that when I present this work to a very general audience, usually I get a lot of nodding, even from very normal people, people that would dislike almost every, every other book I've written. But this is one thing where it speaks so much to people's first-hand experience. They're saying, yes, yes, of course. Yes, I wasted a ton of time in school learning stuff that I never needed to know again. <laughs> yes, yes, of course, of course, of course. And finally, I say, so let's have less of it. And that's where people lose their minds. Like, what? <laughs> do less of it? Well, just because I said it was completely worthless doesn't mean we should have less of it. Um, why? Why? Well, all right. And this is where people often go pretty crazy. But 
I mean, the logic is sound, right? If you really agree that it is not actually teaching useful skills, that it's just provoking credential inflation, then why not just get credential deflation by, via austerity? Which, by the word, way, way is one of my favorite policy words that other people use as a negative, but I want to reclaim it as a positive, right? So yes, you know, you people believe in austerity. That's terrible. I said, look, austerity is like my dad in the 80s when I said, hey, dad, can I have 20 bucks? And he says, first of all, Brian, what do you need it for? Second of all, what happened to the last 20 bucks? You know, third of all, like what sign do I have that I'm getting any value out of any of this? And these are all great questions to ask, first of all, when it's your money, but especially when it's someone else's money, like taxpayers' money. This is what any responsible agent of taxpayers does. So when someone says we need 100 billion bucks, you say, first of all, what do you need it for? Second of all, what do you do with the last 100 billion bucks? And the third of all, what sign do we have that any of this is working? So, so Brian, let's let's say I'm a skeptic here for a second, and I'm you know I'm reading your book, I'm listening to you on the podcast, and I'm just like, you know what, Brian, I don't I don't believe you all that much. It's, you know, you're saying it's signaling. You know, can you give me some evidence for that? Can you give me some mm -hmm. some either studies or just real life examples of you know this looks like you know since you know since we all remember this happening, that that kind of is evidence that it's signaling occurring. Sure thing. So, I mean, honestly, I normally just start with people's firsthand experience and say, oh, okay, let's, let's not talk about any big political philosophy or anything. Where did you go to school and what happened there? And you're like, you're like, so if you went to college, so what did you major in? Do you use that major in your job? And, you know, like, what about classmates that you have? Do they use that, that major in their job? You know, so, like, what fraction of the time that you were there or were you actually learning anything that we use today? And I find that almost everyone actually quickly says, yeah, well, yeah, of course, of course. Yeah, I mean, I don't use much of what I learned. You know, like even people that learned a lot of higher mathematics usually don't actually use that math in the job. So, I mean, obviously people are using very little of the humanities or the social science in their jobs. So, you know, but it made me a well-rounded human being. Yes, Brian. yes. Well, it very well might, but here's the thing. That's changing the subject. So the yeah, let, let him get, let him get the example. Is, is it, you know, like, like, having, like, is it actually a useful preparation for, uh, you know, for a career than saying, well, maybe not, but something else. It's like, all right, you know, like, did you just concede the point? Did you just concede the point? All right, that it's not actually very relevant to what's going on. And then, of course, I'm very happy, and I do have a chapter in my book about these broader, you know, broader, broader enrichment of human life. And this is where I just say, okay, fine, that's the theory. Did that really happen? How much Shakespeare do you read? All right, for fun. How many? You know, so I say, like, I watch a lot of. I watch like almost every Shakespeare movie, but this is rare. It's deviant behavior to watch a lot of Shakespeare movies. So, <laughs> any of the same, you know, like how much poetry do you read for fun? It's like, well, then how can you say that it, the, the poetry class changed your life when you it plays no part in your life at all? Uh, but in terms of like, like other kinds of evidence, more formal academic evidence, part of what I do is just gather the statistics on how people spend their time in school. So we can see, first of all, in high school, it's actually a quite modest share of the day that's spent on literacy and numeracy. There's just a lot of other subjects that people spend time on stuff where it's very hard to see that it would be likely to be used in real life. And then similarly for college majors, I just go over what are the what is the breakdown of majors? Uh, very often people today who know the numbers will say, well, liberal arts have fallen a lot, so now it's practical. It's like, okay, <laughs> it's true the liberal arts have fallen a lot, but that doesn't mean it's practical. Uh, there's been a mo very modest switch to STEM. But it's modest for the simple reason that most people just find STEM so hard and discouraging that they would just you know, they would just fail out or give up. You know, what, basically what we switch to uh, primarily is from traditional liberal arts like history and political science over to pseudo vocational subjects like psychology and communications. Why do I call them pseudo vocational? Because every year we are graduating more people with majors in these subjects than there are jobs in the entire industry. So obviously, there are, you know, most psychologists cannot become psychologists. Most people in communications cannot get into the media because we are, we're, we are churning out roughly 30, 30 or 40 times as many people as there are jobs in the industries. So, you know, so they, again, they sound vocational, but they're really not. Basically, you know, like what's going to happen is they'll probably end up working in a bank or something like that. Uh, so then finally, I also talk quite a bit about the – fact, as I was mentioning before, that so much of the payoff for education comes from the last year, comes from graduation. Maybe that was a different one. But anyway, so it's true that a great deal of the payoff for education seems to come from the last year. And again, this is something where the uh, this would make some sense if, you know, if uh, in the signaling model where people are saying, well, did he finish? Well, there's people finish or cut above, people don't finish. 
It makes very little sense in terms of learning useful skills. Is what are we to think that you save the useful skills till graduation year? It's like three years waste your time, and now let's crack <laughs> open the real stuff, right? Any, I've never met anyone who actually. The pay bump comes right right when you get the degree, right? It's not like three years; you get seventy five percent of the. Yeah, 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 exa exactly. Yeah, so and so in the book, I also use that to get at least a a lower bound on how much signaling is going on. Uh, so I mean, these you know, then I, you know, I talk about a few other approaches, but that's the quick version. Yeah, I remember some of my favorite examples that you've brought up before is that. You know, as a college student, when you go in and you go to rate my professor, one of the positive ratings is easiness, right? Yes, so if yes. You're an easier yeah. professor, then uh, that's a good thing. Yeah, easy equals good. good. And there's no rating for teaches lots of valuable job skills. Right, right. And there's a chili pepper for hotness. There's a hotness, but, yeah. They yeah, <laughs> yeah, but there isn't like a you know, like a, a two fists for you'll really use this in real life or anything. And this, this this really reminds me of what, of something that I saw right when the coronavirus lockdown of the public school sector started, and I was mentioning this on a podcast the other day, and I and I uh, told everybody to go read your book, obviously, uh, because it, it reminded me of it. I love you too, Corey. Uh, <laughs> I love you too, man. But uh, but but what was going on at the beginning of all the school closures was a lot of discussions about let's just give all the kids an A. And I saw this at a Seattle public mm -hmm. schools, for example, and they were they were saying, well, we don't want to pump, uh, punish the kids for the pandemic, so we're going to give them all easy A's. But <laughs> and that that's kind of evidence that it's all about signaling because yeah. if you know uh, it's it's more it's more about the grade than actually teaching the kids uh, the skills that that they're going to get. Yeah, yeah. And the never, never mind, of course. This what this does is punish the kids that were doing their work. <laughs> right, right. Everybody, everybody looks the same. So it's like, we don't want to punish kids by basing grades upon our best estimate of how of how much of how, of how well they did. We just want to give everyone the same thing. That's the way to not punish people. It's kind of like the same insanity of a lot of colleges are now saying, look, there won't be any penalty if you don't have any test scores. It's like, so there's still a finite number of, uh, of slots, right? So if you give you better to people that do have that do have good test scores, how does this not automatically mean that you're giving worse treatment to those who don't have test scores? But I mean, you know, like you know, like the people that are saying this propaganda are so not reality focused, so touchy feely, and again, it's just so so dishonest that it's just a. Well, and, and have you seen um, have you seen how like Harvard and a lot of other expensive universities are charging the same amount this oh, year? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yes. I believe my own college has actually raised tuition a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, um, that to me, when I first saw that, I also thought of your book because if it's about getting the Harvard piece of paper, the consumer or, or, or the, the student going to the system is like, okay, it's still worth it to me because I'm still going to get that piece of paper. Yep. And I mean, I would argue a lot of the benefit of going, going to Harvard is the networking, right? Not so much. It's, mm -hmm. It's, it's part of it, part of it getting the piece of paper too, right? But yeah, so a lot, of, a lot of the fun is getting to hang out with the cool kids and me and, and meet the elite. Uh, in terms of how valuable the networking is career wise, uh, what I would say is that that varies tremendously. So here's the thing: there's you know the sociologists especially done a lot of work on the value of networking. And the main punchline is that network helps you if someone either totally loves you, like completely has your back or if they are in exactly the same industry that you're in. Mm. So what you have, fair weather friends who work in different industries than yours mm -hmm. are of no worth. Mm -hmm. they, they either either won't do anything for you or can't do anything for you. So basically what this means is that the kinds of networks that are that are good to get in uh, you know in college would be like if you're going like Stanford CS that's solid gold. Right? Cuz there you're actually uh, you're actually meeting with people that are going to be able to help you in the future and are will going to be ready to do it. But on the other hand, if you're going to Stanford English, the odds that you're ever going to meet anyone that's going to be in a position to help you is very low because while Stanford English graduates do get jobs, they'll just be spread out over the whole economy. You'll probably never see each other again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so playing, playing devil's advocate again, uh, Brian, I, I, I understand your point on signaling. I buy it. You've convinced me. But, you know, well, isn't there a true benefit in signaling and and isn't this the you know if the economically efficient outcome because employers are using this in, information and they need that information to hire the right person and so look um 
this whole signaling thing is is evidence that the market is working in in higher education and education in general. What's your yeah, response? I, I've heard several economists tell me this. Here's the thing: all levels of government are paying over a trillion dollars in subsidies to the status quo right now. This is not just a finger on the scale. This is their full body weight is on the scale of the status quo. So to say that this shows that, that the current system passes the market test is absolute madness. This is like saying that football stadiums are passing the market test when they get 90% subsidies from government. Like, <laughs> this is the exact opposite of passing the market test. You know, this is a very strong sign that you are failing the market test as if you are get, you're getting an enormous amount of subsidies. It's a sign that you probably wouldn't be able to stay in business without that government money. So yeah, so you know, like it is no, it is not true that this is in any way shown to be the, the most efficient system or even a tolerable system. All it really shows, I say, is that when the government puts almost uh, you know, almost all of its money and enormous amount of resources in favor of it, then it's doing well. But again, that doesn't mean that it's a good system at all. It just means that if there's this massive amount of support from government, then this is what we see. So again, of course, you can say, well, isn't there some value signaling? Yes, there's some value. But again, the idea that there isn't a better way out there. Well, like we won't know until we withdraw the subsidies and see, right? And uh, there actually is great evidence that when the cost of education goes up, that people stop doing the standard thing to a large degree. Most of this research, by the way, is done by people who want to argue for more government funding. And they say, look, if we just give more funding, tuition will be lower and more kids will go to college. And I say, yeah, yeah, yeah I think all this works well, <laughs> but we just need to reverse the goal, reverse the goal to cutting funding so fewer people go. Yeah, when I think about this conversation, I, I always bring up things like Praxis, where they're you know trying to build people's portfolios up to uh, you know have a different type of signal on the market as well. So you know there there of course the bachelor's degree is a type of signal, but is it a very good signal? Is it a powerful signal? Is it giving employers a lot of information? I mean, it seems to me that it's, it gives employers the information that you're the type of person that will you know, jump through the hoops for a couple of years. But I, I can imagine, you know, a different system where, you know, you, you show the employer all the work that you've done. Um, and, you know, maybe that's a more powerful signal uh, to the employer, maybe. Yeah. Maybe well, that, so that, that's a good point. You know, that was the question I was going to ask you, Brian. And uh, I'll just add my little two cents to that because that's a great, that's where I wanted to go anyway. You, you've pointed out what's wrong. And this all begs the question, well, what's the right thing to do then? Mm -hmm. What is the right system? What is what is a, a a valid, feasible, viable replacement for the the signaling that we do now? Uh, right, right. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I do that with my dog all the time, Brian. Don't worry. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, so again, to repeat. The number one policy reform that I push is austerity, cutting, less government funding, keep cutting until we see what happens when the subsidies have been withdrawn sufficiently. So, you know, I'd say that when there's no longer any government funding, then we can see what what actually passes the market test. Until then, we can only speculate, right? And again, of course, this does freak people out because they're immediately thinking, what's going to happen with all of the students that can't afford to go anymore? And I say, yeah, yes, okay, that's part of what's going on. There's also the students who don't need to go anymore because now employers take you seriously without a degree, right? So that is the subtle side of, of austerity is realizing that it's not just a matter of being able to go, but it's being able to go compared to what other people are doing. That's, uh, th that is crucial. Now, you know, in my book, I also do talk about what I think is the most promising way to change the way that government spends money, and that is more for vocational education. I think that is both unpopular, but really ha like has shown itself to work very well in a lot of other countries to take it seriously. So I do talk about that too. But again, like you know, truly the cause nearest and dearest to my heart is just sim a simple austerity, cutting spending, saying, what do you need this money for? It doesn't seem like people are getting good value. And if you say that you have a much better way of spending the money, then great, I'll cut the, I'll cut the funding, and then you improve and then maybe get your money back. Like that. <laughs> right, right. I'm with you. So so how about um, a, a big part of this conversation with uh, COVID-19 is that we're seeing a lot of people uh, switch to homeschooling. I mean, a lot oh, yeah. of people experienced homeschooling in some, in some way or another during the spring or at least home-based education. Do you think um, homeschoolers overall can get a better uh, education and have more actual, you know, actual skills 
um, than, than jumping through hoops for, for, for you know, 12 years, 13 years in the K-12 system? Yeah, so I say is that it depends very much on the parent and the child. Right? So though I homeschool, I recognize that it's not for everyone and it works well for some people, not for others. What I would say is under the current circumstances, if your only alternative is Zoom school, then I think homeschooling is a no-brainer, especially if your kids are under, say, 10. So, I mean, right now, if you send your kindergartner to, to Zoom school, you're going to have to be sitting there monitoring that kid virtually the entire yeah. time. So given that you're already doing that, why not just turn off the camera and teach the kid yourself? Like you don't know your ABCs, you don't know arithmetic, right? And then you like it's way less boring because you're actually doing something yourself. You're interacting with your kid. And yes, you can get a lot more done in a much more shorter amount of time. At minimum, you get rid of all of the dead time when your kid understands, but other kids don't. And you also get rid of the waste of time when your kid is behind and uh, and they can't following. So when you when you are homeschooling, like, like like under the current environment, I would recommend it to almost anyone who's got kids under ten, and actually probably most people in general, because you know, even a fifteen year old, how much is a fifteen year old going to be really uh, actually paying attention versus texting <laughs> their phone or or texting their friends, or whatever? So better to just go and do it yourself. Uh, yeah, and um, if you're in places like Tennessee. They uh, they're, they're they're planning um, I think well-being checks in the home, um, or actually no I think there's one place in Tennessee actually that is sending a letter to the parents saying that they cannot uh, watch over their shoulder and watch the, yeah. uh, what's going yeah. on in the virtual. School. So, I think, so I think they, families they, they, well, they can watch the child but not the teacher perhaps. <laughs> Right, yeah, you can, right. you can watch the child, but yeah, don't don't listen to what we're talking about and listen to the lessons that are going on. So I, I, I don't think that's going to get anywhere. But I think you're right that families are seeing like these two options. And it's like, well, one, if it's if it's already pretty much like homeschooling, I might as well take that, you know, marginal change, you know, that that that, that leap of faith, essentially. Or it could also be that they're seeing these other types of things that they don't want to deal with. Right. Well, like. I could just homeschool and not have to deal with um, all these regulations. And some of the school districts are saying like the kids can't wear pajamas during their Zoom classes or or they uh, have to wear masks or or, or some, you know, there was, something that, there was something in the Chicago Tribune that that recently came out where um, I think teachers were calling CPS on families for not logging into Zoom. So I think families are just saying, I'm not messing with this. Like it's 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 not much of a benefit. And then there's all of these other hassles that we're having to deal with. Right. And by the way, one thing that I've even heard from some uh, otherwise astute economists is that the continued closure of public schools reflects parental demand rather than the rather than politics. And for them, I say, look, every <laughs> private school that I know of is opening at least some of the at least some days. Exactly. Because they know that parents are not going to go and pay money in order to go and have their kid go to Zoom school. Uh, so like, like, it, like, it's just crazy to say that this is due to parental demand. It's obviously driven by politics and teachers unions. And, so, you know, the schools that are dependent on, on actual direct you know, funding from, their, uh, from, you know, from, the, from the students and from parents, they know we, at least we have to deliver something to them that they want. And they don't want Zoom school because it, the parents can't do their jobs when the kids are in Zoom school. Uh, so something where you like you like, like, see, like it's very convenient to say oh well, well it's, it's just demand it's not demand well, you know, like parents want their kids to be back in school largely again of course there are some that are that are hyper but you know, like, like parents do not want to pay good money to have their kid get online education because it is ba barely any value and, you know like one of, one of the main things I was saying well like when I was presenting my criticism of education previously is well, at least K through 12 delivers daycare. At least it gives daycare. They don't want to do that anymore. Yes, and now, now it's not even daycare anymore, so it's garbage. But so. if you if you reopen your school and call it a daycare, then sometimes it's okay in certain localities. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, I mean, and you can make money doing it, more money doing it. Uh, and like some places, they're not allowing private schools to reopen, so the private schools are literally getting their people certified as daycare providers. And then, okay, it's it's fine to reopen as, as long as you're not – supposedly doing the learning part. The, you just the virus can't teach anybody. Yep. You just yep. can't teach anybody. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> it's crazy. So, so Brian, chapter 11 in your book right here. I'm going to do it, Corey. You ready? Yeah, chapter 11 in your book. Chapter 11? I thought there were <laughs> two chapters. 
No, it's it's titled "What to Do in Case of a Global Pandemic." Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us what what is it? What what is that chapter? What does it look like? What does Brian Kaplan say? Yeah, I mean, I guess I, I would say what I say for everything else, which is I think that the you know, the response has been a, you know, like a, a gross exaggeration of, of anything reasonable, right? So you know, like so if you like you know, like you know, COVID is much more serious than flu. Right. So if we did, you know, like if we did for, you know, for COVID, what we do for flu, there'd probably be 10, you know, 10 years worth of fatalities in a single year. So what I say is, look, all right, fine. So it's more serious than flu. So let's do, say, 10 times what we do about flu. In practice, we've probably done about a thousand times as much as we would do for flu. Mm -hmm. yeah, so and again, I say that's a reasonable benchmark. So it's something where if 100,000 people die in a year for flu, there'll be a, little, you know, a, bit, of, a, bit, a bit of propaganda saying get flu shots. Maybe there'll be some subsidized flu shots. So, you know, like, like you might go and have you know, like a vaccine van going by. You might have a little bit of social pressure saying, oh, did you get your flu shot? And we do 10 times that. And then we can, then we're done and the chips fall where they may. That's like, I think like, you know, a generally reasonable view, obviously highly unpopular, but you know, like it always comes down to, there's a bunch of familiar risks that we accept that lead to very large numbers of deaths every year. Right. And, no one seems to have any interest in shutting down society because of all the familiar risks. But a new risk comes along, and then people have a very different reaction. Mm -hmm. like, you know, yeah, it's kind of like the unknown, right? Where, 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 like you can have massive deaths from coal mining, and people just say, well, coal mining, you know, people get black lung. But you talk about building a nuclear power plant with an expected you know, body count of 0.1 person per century, and people lose their minds. Ooh, I mean, <laughs> it's radiation. Oh, what if there's a meltdown? Oh, what is it? You know, so... That's the you know that's the way that I think about all risk is we need to be super hard headed, cold hearted, quantitative people, and just say, look, this oh, like life is risk. You can't you know, like any time you drive to the store, you are putting your life in danger to a very very small amount. And when we decide upon any kind of appropriate response risk, tell me the freaking numbers every time. Don't give me stories. Don't <laughs> try to make me sad. If you're trying to make me feel sad, I know that you are, are, are not a really reliable person to talk to about this. People like you need to be ignored. Come yeah, on, Brian. Make... It's my family member, though. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so you, know, you take your kid to the store. You're, you're betting your kid's life that you can get to the store and back alive. <laughs> Right? I mean, well, like, what's like, interesting I remember, is like, my first two kids were twins. I remembered when, like, like, I always knew every time I cross the street, I'm risking my life. And then I've got these two twins and a twin stroller, and I'm thinking, okay, now I'm risking three lives when I cross the street. Yeah. What do I do? Yeah. I, I look one extra time, and then I cross the street, which is what a reasonable person does. <laughs> you know, I, mean, like, I mean, this kind of this kind of reminds me of this the whole notion where people are more afraid of riding on airplanes, right, and, and yes. flying, even though the risk is lower than driving in a car, and it might have something to do with control, I guess. It's just fear of the unknown or something. Yeah, yeah there's, there's a whole psychological literature on how people respond to risk. And again, it's basically just a list of cognitive failings of human beings. We like, like new risks. People free, like people are much more nervous about new risks than old risks of the same severity. They're much more nervous about weird, sort of like invisible risks, like radiation. It's like, ooh, it's radiation. It can't be seen. You're like, like, like whereas like coal smoke. It's like, oh, well, it's like just regular old coal smoke. It's not invisible, <laughs> right? You have things like that. And of course, a lot of this is driven by sheer conformity. If other people are worried about it, I'm worried about it too, right? Mm -hmm. So, so you know, like, like you know, my colleague Robin Hanson was pointing out how, uh, what, you know, like initially there's a lot of, there were pressure to wear a mask and gloves. Now the gloves have almost disappeared outside of people working in jobs, right? And is this because of any actual science saying that gloves weren't effective? So I, I, I follow the science fairly closely. I don't see the, any, any evidence that anyone was uh, like, has come up with any new evidence on the effectiveness of gloves. It's more of, well, other people are doing masks. So I have to have a mask. Other people don't do gloves. So I don't need to do gloves. It's like, like you realize these people don't know any science, right? Like all they're doing is copying other ignorant people. So what does that prove? But, <laughs> this is not, but normal human beings respond to risk in this very sheeply way. Yeah, but I, I like that you pointed out the difference, you know, between sectors here. And I think that's really important for this podcast that we have a lot of other sectors reopening and actually yes. fighting to reopen so that they can stay in business. You can see the daycares reopening, but then it comes when it comes to the sectors that get your money either way, uh, yes. Yes. The public school sector. And it's not that they're bad yeah. people. It, it could be that they're actually afraid. A, a large majority of them, it could be. But they have an incentive structure 
that's set up to stay home and work, right? From home yeah. instead of going in and right, 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 right at a course. And precisely because they're getting the money either way, there's also no effort to come up with a reasonable compromise of saying, well, we'll have Zoom school taught by teachers that are over 55 years old or that have a demonstrable health care you know, and, and uh, you know, documented severe health risk. And we'll assign those to go and teach the kids that are too scared. And then we'll go and put the other teachers together with the kids that aren't too scared. And we'll try to make, you know, try to make people reason, reasonably happy and reasonably safe. And to say like, and reasonably safe is all that we should ever shoot for in life. Anyone who tells you that we should be totally safe is just a, you know, is, is as the Roman, Roman emperor, uh, emperor, uh, let's see, Justinian, the apostate said, is a deluded man trying to delude you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, we have a question here from Kelly. Do you, yeah. Kelly Smith. We had him on, uh, on our podcast a couple of months ago. Great conversation. He has a question here for you, Brian, how much of K-12 is signaling versus other things? Do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. So in my book, I, all my, I, 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 you know, the, the youngest grades that I talk about in any depth where I've got any decent data is high school. You know, for high school, I would say that typical high school student doesn't, you know, you know, they need some structure in their lives, but it doesn't need to be school. They could be working a job, for example, doing an apprenticeship, something like that. So I'd say that once you're that age, the amount of daycare that you really need is, uh, you know, is, is modest, right? You know, like, like, you know, so like maybe they'll get in trouble or, or like, like if they're, if they don't have someplace to be, but it's not like they need to be protected from lighting themselves on fire you know, often anyway. <laughs> uh, for the younger kids, then, yeah, I think that, you know, the youngest kids, it is much more about daycare. Although you know, even there, what's interesting is since education is so cumulative, where you know, like, you know, like you need, you need the elementary school to go to do middle school, you need the middle school to do high school, you need the high school to do college. So sort of the main question to keep in mind is like what would happen in the, you know, within, in the normal system to someone who just says, I'm refusing to do some classes, right? And right. it varies, but like a lot of times they'll just say, look, you just can't graduate. You can't be part of this. So in that case, I would say that even when it might see, not seem like there's really much signaling going on, there's sort of like a derived signaling where this is the signal to signal to signal. So yeah. ultimately, it, you know, like, like the art and music that you have to do in fourth grade Really, it's something where if you simply refuse to do it, uh, this will cause a chain reaction of problems for you in life all the way down to, well, you can't be in the honors classes and therefore you can't go to a good college. Yeah, so Brian, um, you have a lot of uh, experience with the, the homeschooling your children. Uh, if you were giving me advice for um, if I wanted to start homeschooling children tomorrow, uh, what are your recommendations? Maybe, maybe top three or just maybe a couple. Yeah. So to my mind, there are two purposes of homeschooling. First of all, to prepare the child for an independent adult life. And second of all, to let them have a good childhood. So those are the two guiding principles that I always have in mind. And in order to actually figure out what's right for your kid when applying these principles, you got to figure out like, well, what would the kid be interested in? What, 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 what is he good at? So I mean, some, for some kids, they might say this kid just loves you know, work, being around a construction site. In that case, so this kid needs to be able to read and write and do and do some math and even some geometry if you're doing construction. But then a lot of other stuff he really doesn't need to do. And if he finds it super boring, then why make him? Why not instead go and try to get him onto a construction site as soon as as soon as that's actually doable? Right? You know, like for some other kids that are really interested in this material, in material say, well, like maybe history isn't useful, but they like it, so we're going to do that. And then there's everything in between. Um, in terms of like general advice. So there's a very wide range of what homeschooling is. So there's everything from ones where the, you teach it just like a regular class and you sit a kid in a chair and you stand up in front of a blackboard and lecture at them for seven hours straight. There's that. And at the other end is what's called unschooling, where you just let the kid do whatever he wants and hope that he makes good choices. Right. <laughs> so my own view is that people greatly underrate unschooling. It works a lot better than you would expect. However, there, I, I do see one consistent problem with unschooling, which is that unschoolers are bad at math. Even very smart unschoolers who have an illustrious background of quantitative genius, still I have met, I have met them and like they like they they like oh, their math is very poor. So I mean, you know, my view is that for you know like like for, you know like if you're thinking about unschooling, I would just say just do a slight modification, do you know, you know like you know, one to two hours of mandatory math and then unschooling. Right, so, but, but Brian, we don't need the math, right? We don't. This is just extra stuff. Yeah, what, jumping through the hoops. That's that's why unschoolers aren't. Really yeah, so you know, the math is different from the other stuff. 
in two ways. First of all, there really are a great number of desirable careers where if you don't know math, you can't do them. And if you don't know math, learn math well enough as when you're young, you'll never catch up. So that's one thing. Now, it's true there are plenty of jobs that don't use math, but you really wanted to say, oh, this five-year-old isn't going to do any of those jobs. Like, well, you know, I don't know. You do really want to take that opportunity away from him. It seems <laughs> like that's where Roll the dice on that one. Deep. And then here's the other thing. Despite the occasional claim by someone to love math, almost no one on earth really loves math. It is a you know, like generally a distressing, disturbing, boring, <laughs> aggravating thing to do. Like, you know, like you know, this is you know, like for almost all people, math is not fun. You know, every now and then I literally love math because there's definite right and wrong answers. And then when people say that, I say, that's why people hate math. People don't want something with definite right or wrong answers. They want to always have the illusion that they know what they're talking about. That's what human beings really want. So that's why people don't like math is because there's someone saying, no, the answer is pi. They're like, oh, but couldn't it be like three? No, it can't be like three. <laughs> and the story that has been proven, it is known. Right. So that's why I would... You know, if someone if someone asked and they're saying a thing of unschooling, I would just say just tweak the unschooling just a little bit, and then I think you can get rid of the main problem with unschooling, which is the kids are enumerate. Again, you know, of course it does vary. There are far plenty that will actually be good, but you know, essentially the main thing I've noticed about unschoolers is that you know, there are I've met many smart unschoolers whose le whose knowledge of math is like at a level so low. I just I'm, I'm stunned. Hey, Amen. The unschoolers that the on the other end of the spectrum that have, that have done really well or. So, hmm, I don't think I can't say that I've met anyone like that. I mean, you know, it's true that probably the greatest math prodigies are also homeschooled. Probably not unschooled, though. <laughs> right. So, probably, yeah, the un, uh, 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 yeah. In terms of like, and, and is math, that unschooled math prodigy? Hmm, I got no clue. Do you, and do, you, do you think that's just the result of, you know, math is a pain and people just won't pursue it? Um, yeah, that's naturally. You know, I mean, all the other thing, of course, is that math is like the Olympics. Where there are some, where there are some people, including some parents, that are willing to give up their whole lives to achieve world class excellence. So, and, and of course, I mean, I often tell my kids, you don't have to be anywhere near that good to, to do well with math. You know, as, you, as long as you're in the top two percent of math, then almost all careers are open to you, right? And actually, the super math geniuses just become math professors, probably, and then who, like whoever even finds out about them being alive. Right. <laughs> right. So, um, you know, like other things about uh, about homeschooling. So I generally advise people to start with the, with the, the least favorite subject of the day first, and then just do it do it in reverse order. So whatever your kid yeah. likes the least, make them do that first, and then the, next, the second least favorite thing, do that second, and so on, and then finally end the day with what they really like doing, and then this uh, the, the, this gives you a good you know, good structure to your day if you if you feel the need to monitor them. And also, it then means that they get what they don't want to do out of the way, and then the rest of the day, you know, they can relax, you can relax. So, recommend that. And then, you know, like honestly, you know, like talk to your kids. You know, like obviously, the older they are, the better this works. But like, find out what they really want to do, and you know, be flexible. So, you know, like like I, I have my kids do have a writing period, forty five minutes of writing. But I say you can write about anything you want, right? And my daughter said, "Can I can I write comics?" And I said, "Okay, yeah, fine. You can write comics. Great." Right, or show me, show me your comic. They're good. All right, so that's good. You know, of course, you want to do like a you know, choose your own adventure series. Like, great, that's fantastic, right? So I don't go and say, no, 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 you have to do what I did on my summer vacation or something like that. Hey, Brian, didn't you recently say that uh, one of your one of your children got a publication in a, in a career? Uh, we're, we're, we're getting close. close so. Yeah, yeah. So Tell it's us an academic about that. publication going through the whole refereeing process. And how, wait, how old? How old? Uh, they're seventeen. <laughs> Yeah, so so, so, awesome. so I don't want to I want don't want to jinx it, but yeah, I had my well, and R and R is a really good. You know, like my really homeschoolers did some independent study at George Mason, and then I said, okay, well, like there's all like anything that you're ever writing, always be thinking about a way to publish it. There's no reason to write something only for a class, and you know, like like yeah, they took this advice, so uh, hopefully that'll work all work out. For That's reference, cool. for reference, for listeners, my first publication that was peer reviewed probably wasn't until. Uh, 24 years old or something yeah. and graduate, I, right? seven, so. I was able to tell my kids yeah you're 10 years ahead of me great yeah awesome. it's crazy so that's that's really good and and you know even if you publish in grad school that's usually like a really oh, good yeah of thing. course of course um so, so getting yeah. an academic job and not getting an academic job these days yeah so sure. i i just want to hit on um maybe one or two 
homeschool myths that I call them or, or, or devil's advocate questions. Brian, uh, if, if, if there are, you know, kids gathering together in big uh, factory schools, how will they become socialized? Because, they, you know, they got to get, that's the point of schooling, right? They, they, they learn how to be good people and how to interact with other, other people. And how do you do that with uh, a homeschool situation? Yeah, of course, these days it's no longer relevant for a lot of people because they would be at home either way. So unless you're going to say, oh, you're getting great socialization by looking at little squares of children bored out of their minds. Well, I don't see what socialization you're even getting anymore, really. So, I mean, in a way, I think it would just be like making people really like just feel grossed out by the whole experience. But in any case, but under, under normal circumstances, what I'd say is that, you know, as, you know, there are a lot of ways of getting socialization. Right. So just you know, having friends, activities, work, these are all good ways for kids to meet other kids and ones that all that the large majority of homeschoolers do. So and again, like, like, you know, it's much more important to have you know, like one or one or two or three close friends than it is to know 100 kids. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so, you know like, like obviously, obviously, you know, like just being around hundreds of people isn't of great value. It's actually making, you know, having closer bonds where you really interact with someone. So there's that. Uh, yeah, you know, and like, like a lot of homeschoolers really make an effort to go and get their kids out to meet other kids, uh, you know, like whether it's other homeschoolers or just other kids or just regu regular kids doing regular school. Right. The other thing is that it's important to remember that there, there's many kinds of socialization. So right. Our current society puts immense, uh, immense weight upon same age socialization. But what's so great about same age socialization? <laughs> right. So like, like right now, well, you guys, let's see, up, right? you, guys the same age, you don't look like the same age to me. In fact, no, the three of us do not look like the same age, but we're all socializing together. And that is actual real life is mixed age socialization of people of very widely varying ages, all hanging out together and doing stuff. And yet we have a system where we put enormous weight upon socializing with people who are exactly in the same one year age band as yourself and cut them off from people, even one or two grades or, 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 or older or younger, much less from adults. So yeah, so like you know, for my homeschoolers, I put a lot of emphasis upon meeting adults and being good at interacting with adults and being a part of the adult world because that's the world you're going to be in for the rest of your life. So I so said, let's prepare for that. And you know, like, like I think it's great for kids to have friends their own age, uh, but you know, like, like it doesn't have to be exactly their own age. It could be two years older than you, could be two years younger than you. And when I was in high school, I had a Dungeons and Dragons group where we had people up to 30 playing in my group. And I was like, yeah, and my parents thought it was weird. Like, should you be with your people your own age? Well, there's some play with my own age. When there's like John who's 30, well, then he's a stockbroker. Why Why shouldn't we play with a stockbroker? It's like, I don't know. What, what's all that could go wrong? Right. <laughs> um, I love that. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, just, just, you know, like, like getting kids used to meeting adults and interacting with them. So, yeah. So, you know, like, like, like my sons are super comfortable around professors. Whereas, you know, like most undergraduates, you know, like even in their last year, like, oh, I'm a professor, get off me. I'm a professor, you know, like, you know, my sons just go right up professors and say, okay, what you said on page three. Um, that, that's a much, 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 you know, much, much better skill to have than just, you know, greatly amplifying, you know, like being able to get along with other kids that are exactly your age. Yeah, I wonder if some of that has to do with kind of the, uh, the authority structure of the teacher in the K through 12 public school system where, Kind of people go through the K through 12 public school system and they kind of learn that you know they're the old you know the the authority figure you, you have to be you know do whatever they say to get a good grade and kind of i don't know maybe that kind of relationship is what they learned and so maybe they take that into college as well whereas the homeschool uh children don't have that same kind of dynamic with the adults that they're interacting with it breaks down some of those barriers between relative power I, I, what do you think, Brian? I mean, there's probably some of that, although I think it's a lot more just about ex the amount of experience you get. Because if you're in a class with 30 kids, at most you're getting one thirtieth of the teacher's time. So you get almost no time to interact with the teacher one-on-one, -on -one, and that's what's really valuable. Whereas with kids your own age, of course, you're doing that all the time. You know, on the other hand, if you are, if you have a job or you work with some adults, then you're getting a lot of time with them. So, so yeah, I'd that say makes that's sense. That's a bigger one. I mean, here's the thing, you know, like, you know, uh, one thing I'll definitely say, at least for elementary school teachers, is in my experience, they are super nice. They're really, really, really nice. They baby the students, right? And so the idea that someone would learn to fear teachers from, like, when someone is saying, all right, oh, you little, little angels, come along now. <laughs> like, 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 I don't think they're getting scared by those teachers. 
Maybe you start getting scared by your high school gym coach who's calling you maggot solo. Oh. <laughs> so that actually happened when like when I was in high school, like we were regularly called uh, like harsh names by gym teachers on the team. Like, every day, like multiple you know, like, 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 like heavy levels of, of verbal abuse. Uh, from what I see or hear from kids now is that that, that has been greatly curtailed. So you no longer are uh, just being being insulted by your teacher in high, in, uh, high school. <laughs> yeah. Another so response that I have to the socialization question is, well, one, you know, whenever I went through the public school system, my teacher always told me to stop socializing. So that was not something I was supposed to be doing very often. But then two, there's a lot of negative forms of socialization in the yes, public yes. system too, like the, the bullying and then drugs mm -hmm. that can happen. And so not all socialization is yeah, positive sure. socialization. Yeah, I mean, and, and just yeah, so you like you are often in this Lord of the Flies situation, and anyway, and and one, and one where there's you know, like so when I was growing up, there was immense pressure on kids to work things out for themselves. Let's say you know, so like, let's work <laughs> things out for ourselves here, all right? Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, and this was a rationale for like why it was okay for my brother who was four years older than me to beat me up is my parents said, work it out for yourselves. <laughs> I think that, I mean, my view is it's been a big improvement that schools do, like no longer have such a lack of days attitude towards violence between, between children. And like, looks like a bigger kid, he works it out with his fists and the little kid works it out by being beaten. Right. So, and, you know, this stuff still goes on. Of course it varies quite a bit, but at least there's some effort made to get that under control. But yeah, there's a lot of very bad socialization. And again, just from trapping people together, trapping people together that don't want to be together. So, I mean, there's, it's an exact, you know, like the old saying that if you put two of the same thing in a cage, they'll, they'll never, one will inevitably kill the other. That's an exaggeration. But, uh, <laughs> you, know, the, the, you know, the point of when people don't want to be together, that there's re those recurring conflict. That's true. And the cage part is uh, important to point out too, because uh, we have compulsory education laws and a lot of the children don't want to be in these uh, situations for 13 years. Yep of yeah. their lives um but an, you know another thing is uh um oh a couple of months ago uh there was a harvard law school professor elizabeth bartlett called for what she called a presumptive ban i would call an all-out ban because wow. she said even if you're deemed worthy you still have to send your kid to the public school for a couple of courses mm -hmm. um on and she wanted to essentially have a ban on homeschooling this you know got tons of play in the media a lot of people there's a lot of backlash on this. Uh, what are your thoughts on the whole debate that happened a few months ago about, you know, a, a presumptive or an all out ban on the practice of homeschooling? Right. So it's easy to forget just how totalitarian some human beings are, <laughs> but they're out there. There's people who it's not enough that they have over a trillion dollars of subsidies for this crummy system that they believe in for reasons best known to themselves, but a small number of dissenters, they want to go and force them in on threat of what? Possibly child protective services, taking your kids away from you if you're defiant in order to make everyone go and do the same crummy thing they're doing. I mean, what can you do about that about with people like that? I mean, I, I, in situations like this, I remember King Thaden in, the two towers saying, you know, what can men do against such reckless hate? Right? You know, so it is just a, you know, a, a demented <laughs> mentality that someone would look at a total stranger and say, do you know what I need to do? Take their kids away from them and make them go to the school that they think stinks. And you know, yeah, well, like maybe it does, but still everyone should have to go and be together and be part of this crummy thing. So yeah, that's, I mean, Short of people telling me about how we should bring back the draft or national service, that's probably the most personally upsetting thing to me that someone can say is you know, when someone starts talking about the draft or national service, they're like, You're, you want to enslave my children? No, no, I mean, like, that, that is absolutely not. Like, this is the kind of thing that makes me that, that like, like, like it, it makes me feel ways towards other people that I don't want to feel. It makes me feel, it, makes me, it fills me with misanthropic energy with it, that I'm doing my best not to have. Like, why, like, like, why can't you just leave us alone in some small way, right? Rather than do go and treat us this way. Well, yeah, I mean, it, so yeah. So you, I'm sure you heard this Brian, but on the same vein, uh, a couple of months ago, there was a lot of play and this these recordings, these, uh, I can't remember what was the guy's name, Corey. Yes. 
Uh, I mean, he goes so far as to say, and he's not alone, mind you, mm -hmm. uh, but he goes so far as to say that uh, homeschool is abuse, right? <laughs> and so, like, there, I mean, just the act of keeping your of your kid keeping your kids out of school is abuse. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know if that was Dwyer that said that, but I was thinking you were coming up with the quote where he said the reason uh, child parent relationships exist is because they oh, because the of state the state yeah legal parenthood some some crazy stuff but yeah more recently uh one of those harvard professors uh was on a podcast the other day saying something along the lines of uh you know some districts are 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 planning uh you know at home well-being checks and she thought that just that was a wonderful idea that the government was going to come do these at home well-being checks uh, in people's homes. And Tennessee was one of the states that was planning on doing yeah. this. Yeah. Come back with a warrant, man. Yeah. Fourth <laughs> Amendment. Fourth Amendment. Right. What are you doing? It's crazy. Right. And and some people on on social media were like, oh, I'm actually OK with that. If, if, if the family can, you know, refuse them at the door. But the whole point of this is yeah. to, to sneak yeah. up on the parents. And if they didn't answer, you know, the implementation would be in a way that Oh well, they're they're showing signs of you know not they're not complying. So what have you, you got, got to, to hide? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the idea. So I mean, just like the, the level of, of dogmatism of people saying that homeschooling is abuse. So actually, my older sons uh, they went back to regular high school for for the first three weeks of ninth grade because their mom really wanted them to really wanted them to try. And if anyone had talked actually talked to them during that time and said, well, what do you think? They said, look, I absolutely hate this. I want to go back to homeschool. This is what I like. I, you know, this, this is terrible right here. I mean, you could say that they were, they've been brainwashed by me for uh, to be able to homeschooling them, but you know what? Regular school had seven years to brainwash them to think that regular school was good and that didn't work. <laughs> Maybe they actually got some firsthand experience with two alternatives and decided that one was good and one was bad because they saw both with their own eyes and they've got some common sense. Right. And again, you know, of course, you know, like I know there are some homeschoolers who say that they didn't like it. You know what else? There are some kids who went to regular school who say they didn't like that. So keep keep all four quadrants in mind before you start throwing around big claims about how one is bad. So, so what do you think about this whole thing that's been in the news with the pandemic pods? They call them. I, I just refer to them as micro schools where you get five, you know, yeah. five to ten students together in a household. Do you think that's kind of a uh, a way forward? Do you think it's mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, to me, it's better. Very or, I, I, mean, I, I enjoyed the idea of doing it myself. The main issue is just that I, uh, I was just looking into the liability because, uh, you know, like I, I would be nervous about, like, can I lose my home because I go and have some kids over and charge their parents something to teach them, right? And like, well, like, are the waivers actually binding? So I was looking into Virginia, waivers are not technically binding, but maybe they could be. And then, you know, like when my wife are saying, well, maybe we should go and like we rent you a space. And I'm like, oh, God, I don't want to do that. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, if it's just a matter of just adding more students to something that I'm already doing and I'm comfortable with and fe doesn't feel and feels like, like, like something that is not a burden to me that I'm interested in. But it's something where I have to go and basically just change jobs from being an educator to being an administrator. I don't want to do yeah. that. <laughs> and again, for a, for a small school, like if I tried hiring an administrator, then there'd be you know, like no money in it anymore. That would eat up all the costs probably. So that really doesn't make much sense. But yeah, I mean, you know, but you know, like uh, if you can make this work or if you've got people that, you know, that, that you, that you can uh, you know, be part of where you, where you trust them, like you can do with relatives or something like that. Then again, I think that this, this is a great idea. And again, it's something where I have again, thought about it. I mean, honestly, especially if my university winds up shutting down again, I mean, like I like I am so mortally lonely right now. <laughs> you know, like, like, you know, I mean, I know I know people say, "Oh, this is great. I'm getting a lot of work done." I'm like, "This too is too much. It's 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 twenty four seven work." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So yeah, this is Groundhog Day to me. Uh, it, so. It's kind of an interesting. Uh, on that note, you know, you going and opening a uh, a school or renting a facility or something that just jogged my memory. I, I was talking with some guys the other day that deal in real estate. And uh, on the same line, they were like, I wonder if it would be feasible for us to go and find uh, find a building that we could do some, you know, tenant improvements on mm -hmm. and and kind of do like an executive suite kind of setup, mm -hmm. but but customize it for micro school 
yeah, yeah. Uh, family or groups. Mm-hmm. I thought it was really interesting. Like, I mean, already now. So obviously you have families talking about it. Like, hey, let's get our kids together. You know, you, me and her and him. Let's mm-hmm. all pool our kids and, and we'll rotate them through our houses. Or you always come to my house. But now, like, it's gotten so much traction, I think, now, obviously, now that people in the real estate market or industry are saying, hey, maybe we could rent space to those groups. Yeah, I mean, plus there's probably tons of commercial space that is known that is that is people that folks yep. have, so. Interesting. And this would be, be much more likely to happen, right, if we had the money following the child. We, of course, oh, we yeah. have to bring up the space yeah. on this podcast. But, yeah, $15,000 a kid. You, if you get 10 kids, that's 150 k I mean, it obviously, wouldn't all go to the uh, the parent? Maybe the parents pay some extra on the side too. If if that, that's not enough, I think that would probably be enough uh, in revenues. But um, yeah, I wanted to get your thoughts on another thing going on in Fairfax County, Brian. Um, Fairfax County Public Schools—they're not reopening in person, right? Um, but they are reopening about thirty-seven of their schools, so about twenty percent of their schools, as like. I don't know, child care centers. And so they're charging families up to 368 bucks a month. So you're paying through the property tax system. And then, you know, we're not going to open our schools and we're not going to give you a refund, but we are going to open the schools, call them something else and charge you extra. What are your thoughts on, I mean, that's one of the few uh, districts that are, that are actually doing this. And are, that, are those for kids younger than five or those for school age kids? I believe it's uh, like elementary age uh, children, wow. uh, maybe middle wow. school too, but. Uh, well, you got to give them credit for chutzpah. Right? <laughs> <laughs> like, 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 you know, so as an economist, I guess I'd say, well, better to be open for some purpose than to be open for no purpose. And, you know, the reason why people are paying is because it's you know best, best deal they can get. So, mm-hmm. you know, like I, I can understand the outrage of people saying, well, doesn't this show that you are scamming us? And that's true too, but <laughs> again, you know, like I, I would focus the the criticism on well, like getting you know, like you know, like insisting upon getting money for doing for doing next to nothing rather than for actually making you know, like like trying to be a little bit entrepreneurial about the situation. Yeah, I mean, the way I look at it is they already have money through the property tax system; they should use that. Um, but like, like, like if, if you thought about it from like the private sector, you know, if, if a private school took fifteen thousand dollars from you and said, we're not going to give that back. We're not going to reopen, but we are going to reopen. And if you give us another 15 K <laughs> we'll reopen. I mean, that's how I kind of think about it in terms of, and I think I, I would just be kind of, I would define that as extortion in the private sector. I mean, I've said it before and I'll say it again. The public, ex- the public sector is terrible, <laughs> terrible. And yes, I do work in the public sector. It's great. It's very nice for employees. It's just terrible for customers and for taxpayers. Yeah, yep. that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, it's a monopoly. You have to pay for it. Yep. If you want to choose a different school, too bad. The money uh, yeah, saved. Well, here's the thing. It's worse than a monopoly. Uh, so a regular monopoly, you know, like, like if you have a monopoly over oil, you're still trying to figure out ways to extract oil more cheaply. You're still trying to figure out ways to get the quality up so you can charge a higher price. What we have here is a nonprofit, is a, is a nonprofit monopoly funded by taxes. Right. So then that is really, a really bad. And, you know, I would say it's really the real problem is just the nonprofit status. Uh, we and like, and like the fact that they get their money regardless of whether or not the customers are happy. So, I mean, that's where they can do what uh, they could really can do almost anything they want. And if people don't like it too bad, like, oh, we'll take your home if you stop paying the property taxes. I mean, this is kind of how uh, Mil- Milton Friedman talked about private versus public monopolies. Right. Where he, where he yeah, made the yeah, argument yeah, exactly. that private private monopolies are better because at least you're not compelled to pay for them. Right. You could. Private monopolies are more likely to be replaced. Yes, There's yes. not a gun to your head. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's that's all true. And you know, private monopolies, you know, they also you know, like, like they they still have a reason to try to control costs. So you know, because you know, like you know, if a private if a private monopoly let a, lets a union double the pay of the workers, the, the 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 business loses money. So they don't want to do that. They you know they still want to go and figure out ways of saving money. They they're looking for they're looking for new opportunities. So that part's all good. So, you know, like it's really, you know, or you know, think about this, you could also think about them as being similar to a regulated monopoly where you're the only seller, but, and you're not, and you're, and uh, there's a certain amount of, and there's a certain price you can charge. And then, uh, you know, you know, right. And, you know, and, and, and then that's, you know, if, you, if you come up with any way of doing better then we just, uh, you know, we, we, we don't actually let anyone keep that money. So, you know, like if you're the principal of a school and you figure out a way to make extra money, 
it's not like you can take that money home as a bonus. Right? Mm -hmm. This is the way the non-sector, the non-profit sector works is that, you know, essentially you know, like this. So there's been quite a bit of work done on like public sector compensation and the big punchline, if you just look at cash, then it doesn't seem like they're getting paid that well overall. But if you look at benefits, that's where the whole package is great for the public sector is mm -hmm. cash plus benefits. And then if you start thinking about the, uh, the unpriced benefits, things like job security, things like you like during a pandemic, you don't have to come to work. That's where the disparity becomes truly immense. And you realize that the public sector is very heavily designed around showing great favoritism to the workers at the expense of customers and taxpayers. Yeah, I think the one recent report that I saw on this was that like government employees, they have like a what less than 1% uh, unsatisfactory rating, even though a lot of people have different feelings about you know, of course, there's more than one percent that are that are unsatisfactory, but they have such job security. It's just like, okay, cool, you showed up, you showed up to work. Boom. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean, uh, it's like when their managers evaluate them, almost everyone's satisfactory. Yeah, just yeah, it's the same yeah. thing with teachers, but it's also the right. same thing with other public sector workers. It's not yeah, only yeah, like yeah. an education thing. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there is a general bias to, uh, for any kind of evaluation of just saying someone you works with work with is doing a good job, even in the private sector, but it's not as bad. The private mm -hmm. sector, you might say one out of 10 people isn't cutting it, mm -hmm. uh, which is, however, 10 times as much as in the public sector, say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Brian, we're we're coming up to an hour and we don't wanna take your whole day. We could talk with you for the next three hours, but it is a Friday evening and we want you to be able to get, spend some time with your family as well. Um, I want, want to wrap up with uh, maybe some of your last thoughts on either, you know, whatever you want to, it's your conclusion. You conclude however you want, but uh, if you want to loop your, your book back in again, just to let everybody know, um, this is George Mason university economist, Brian Kaplan. This is his best selling book. Everybody should read it. The case against education, why the education system is a waste of time and money. I think it's extremely relevant now. Uh, but Brian, do you want to conclude with any, thoughts um, in particular to related to the book or, or anything you really want to conclude with? Yeah, I guess, you know, here's the main thing I want to say. So in the book, like I said, the main thing that I push for in terms of reform is less or what I call austerity, it's cutting government spending on education. All right. Now, as I said, whenever I present the argument of the book, I have people, very normal people nodding in agreements, people who would have normally have you know, would be very strongly opposed to anything I'm saying. But when I'm saying, yes, well, most of what you do learn in school is really useful. You feel like, like people forget almost everything they learn. And like I say, oh, very wasteful. And you know, nod, nod, yeah, nod, yeah, yes, yes. And then I say, and therefore, let's have less. And this is where people lose their minds. Right? They say, no, no, you know, no, no, we have to fix it. Right? And my response is always, look, if it was easy to fix, it would have been fixed already. If it was easy to fix, it would have been fixed already. So either there isn't any good way of fixing it, or the system is just so corrupt that we know how to fix it and they don't do it. Either way, just saying let's fix the system that exists is naive and far better just to cut. And you know, like any dummy knows how to cut spending. We don't require a lot of, we don't need to read a lot. We don't have to think a lot. Let's, let, let's just cut back on this and so spend less money on it because we're not getting that good value for it. Uh, but what I would say is however controversial my program there for austerity sounds to you, now it, you've got to admit it makes sense. If the schools are only giving you crummy Zoom school, if you have to sit around and be an unpaid employee of the school while your kid watches it, watches a computer screen, why should you be paying anything for this worth worthless product? This is junk. Nobody would nobody would pay their own money for this stuff. At least almost no one would pay their own money for this stuff. So if there was so if you doubted the case for austerity before, doubt no longer. This this is science. We should cut the funding for education until we get something useful for it. And we're not going to get that until we actually go and take the money away from them. That's hey, Brian, you have an, an actually a really excellent point there. I just got my property tax bill here in D.C. and the public <laughs> school system isn't starting until at least November 7th here. So, <laughs> ah, darn, why did, I, why did I send my money to them? But, yeah, you're right. It's the same same amount of money and they're not even really reopening the service doesn't make any sense. Yep. Yep, yep. So I mean, as bad as it is paying taxes for crummy government services, paying taxes for bupkis. <laughs> it's becoming even worse. It's clearer now than ever, right? That, yeah. that things don't even they, reopen. Maybe they'll shut down the roads and still have the gas tax. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. 
All right, Brian, uh, thank you so much. Uh, again, just a reminder for everyone, this is uh, Brian Kaplan, George Mason, the University Economist. Uh, the Case Against Education, everybody needs to go check it out. I'll put it in the show notes. It's very cheap on Amazon. It's very cheap on Amazon. Why the education system is a waste of time and money. Uh, until next time, this was the Educational Freedom Institute podcast. Thank you so much for joining us.